I don't think Nigel's going to make it back in time. I'm all right. I'm still oh, <laughs> it is I'm a burn. Behind the cat. <laughs> Your ears are burning. It's uh, all right. I feel like that's um, that's good. It's a healthy number of people. Thanks everyone for thanks everyone for joining um, this. Uh, webinar is being hosted by uh, Pasha and myself about how to raise investment before the end of the year. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Um, there will be uh, time for, for questions at the end. Um, but yeah, so just to crack on without further ado. So um, essentially there's a lovely photo of Pasha and myself. Um, really good to see all of you here. Uh, to give a little bit of introduction, Pasha and I are both uh, funding strategists. So um, recognize some of you I've definitely spoken to before, but for those that, that we haven't, essentially we, we speak to founders like yourself uh, every day, basically helping you plan, implement, strategize your, your raises um, and take, uh, essentially increase your, your likelihood of uh, taking capital in and, and reduce the, the equity, hopefully that you're giving away, which is really is the, the goal and I suppose why all of you are here. Um, I not sure i suppose there are some of you out there that, that don't know a tremendous amount about seed legals so uh we close i think it's uh, around a sixth of early stage uh funding rounds using our docs on our platform um so i hope you all find this uh informative so um to have a look at so this start our stats for for the last year um essentially this i just wanted to highlight what a busy time it is uh now going into December, uh, as we get to the end of the year, uh, we've seen a 55% increase in funding round closes between September, October, November, and then uh, December. So we're predicting the same this year. Um, and obviously with a sample size of about a sixth of the, the early stage funding rounds, um, this, this data I would hope is, is fairly accurate. Um, what this sort of represents is a, is a huge investor desire to get these, these rounds uh, closed and, and invest in, in startups like yourselves before the end of the year. Um, there are sort of a few different reasons to go, uh, the reasons for that. Um, however, I would say, you know, uh, actually weirdly, the, the standout one would just be the sentiment of it being the end of the year. Can we get this wrapped up uh, prior to Christmas? Um, and additionally, on top of that, um, which Pasha might go into slightly, uh, there are the SEIS factors and uh, basically wanting to use up their allowances. Either way, tremendous investor appetite to invest uh, in, in December, um, which basically we want to make sure that you are all there to, to capitalize on that. Um, and the way to do so uh, are by these sort of three key metrics we've um, established. I know they're slightly vague, but we've, uh, <laughs> we've established that it is an incredibly busy time, the end of the year for fundraising. Uh, you have that increased uh, investor appetite for investing uh, and the increased interest to invest in businesses like yourselves. Um, so what can you guys do to sort of take advantage of that? And on top of that as well, uh, you've only got two months left. You might be wondering, uh, I haven't even opened my, uh, haven't started my round, haven't started my preparation. I'm sure all of you fall on, on a different sort of spectrum there. Um, how can I possibly get it open, let alone closed? Maybe some of you haven't even started reaching out to investors. Um, so basically, uh, not to worry, um, you have to act quickly, but essentially, um, we want to, to, to make sure that you guys can capitalize on, on, on this time of the year. So the three key steps here are uh, preparing, obviously maximizing your timelines and, uh, and, and closing with competence. Essentially, we will touch on, on all three of these in, in various capacities uh, in the next sort of half an hour, 40 minutes or so. But essentially just to, to run through the, the headlines for all of these now. Um, and as my uh, manager says to me all the time, uh, that preparation is key. Failure to prepare is preparing to fail. As soon as you guys know that you want to start raising, um, you should get started as soon as possible um, on the legal side, on preparing your legal framework. Um, and ultimately, that will be uh, enable the, the rounds to take place. And as I will touch in in a little bit on the next slide, it'll also be uh, impressive to investors and A, increase the likelihood of investment and B, uh, increase the speed at which you can uh, navigate through your rounds. In terms of maximizing your timeline, so various parts of the investment and the fundraising process can be pretty time consuming. I'm sure some of you've started advanced assurance applications. If you don't know what that is, we will touch on that later. But um, 
that can be an incredibly time consuming process as well as uh, negotiating with investors um, and generally just doing your background checks, share splits, making sure that you're investment ready. Um, there are ways, which obviously we will touch on, um, of being clever about how you do that um, and basically engaging in, in various processes at the same time and utilizing time in between waiting to hear back from various things can uh, streamline your, your, your process quite a lot and um, hopefully mean that you can uh, close in, in, a, in a much quicker time period and, and capitalize on this period of the year. To take me on then to, to closing with competence, uh, so basically as soon as your terms are agreed, you should be able to move through the, especially with us, you should be able to move through um, the completion steps, uh, shareholders agreement signed very seamlessly and quickly, um, and ultimately uh, tying up your, your legal work, getting your SHO1 form to company's house, um, and being able to spend that investment. Um, so to dig into these a little more, um, sorry, check out that change page. Um, so in terms of, of preparation, uh, as I touched on earlier, two sort of key reasons why, why that's important. Um, if your investors are interested, so the first reason is if your investors are interested or, you know, you've got a great idea, have spoken to them, seems like there's that interest there, um, you want to be able to capitalize on, on that momentum straight away um, and not have to faff about coming back to us essentially to get your cap table sorted, uh, you know, your, your intellectual property assignments, your founders agreements done and, and issuing shares to co-founders. Um, that sort of key, the moment in which you talk to these founders, you want to be able to go, great, okay, that sounds good. You've got all of your stuff sorted in terms of IP assignments, founders agreements, I'll touch on those in a second, um, and basically be able to then give them a term sheet and go, great, if you say you're interested, here's the term sheet, have a look at it. I'll be back to you in a few days uh, and, and take it from there. And losing that week or two to come back and sorting yourself, um, sorting yourself out. Investors are speaking to, to 10 people a week. Um, you know, they, you really want to be able to capitalize in that moment. Second thing, which is, is massively interlinked to that and, and on the point of investors speaking to 10 people a week, um, you know, a, a, a lot of founders or all founders will have, you know, you have your idea, you have your pitch deck, business plan, all of that stuff, um, and you know, have have some great conversations with investors. You want to be able to, to set yourself apart a little bit as well, and having all of your your ducks in the in in the row, having all of your founder stuff sorted before going to them, having enough shares, not having to go and do a share split. Um, and uh, I feel like I use this phrase way too much, but having all your sort of ducks in a row um, prior to those conversations is, is only going to be impressive to them, increase the likelihood of, of, of investment and speed up that, that timeline. Um, so the good thing is uh, when you basically engage with us, um, and I will follow up with contact details and stuff like that at the end, but uh, when you engage with us, uh, we will basically start those background checks for you um, and come back to you with X, Y, and Z that you need to do. Um, so essentially with all the elements of functionality on the platform, we will be able to assist with the early stages, the preparation and these sort of key key docs here. Um, so essentially I'm going to leave the, the, the latter two, the term sheet and the SEIS parts to, to Pasha, but I do want to um, dip into the first two because they are very important. Um, and then the one of the first things that you guys will, will get started with. So you've got your, your cap table in your company's house, uh, in terms of preparing them and then your founders agreements and your IPs assignments. The reasons why these are so important and why you really should do them um, prior to, to having those conversations is essentially uh, your potential investors are going to want to see your cap table. They're going to want to see who owns equity in the business, who they are, what percentage are owned by the founders, hopefully the majority, uh, and generally basically how you've, you've treated your, your equity because how you've treated your equity going into it um, and the people that have... Uh, large basic parts of, of the voting shares in the business are going to be incredibly important and sway uh, founders decisions as, as to you know if they do want to invest um this is similar to the founders agreement so the founders agreement is essentially a document between founders oftentimes you know you won't won't be paid a, a salary at the beginning so it's a founder's pledge if you're you're not being paid a salary i think um and essentially uh this is important for for you guys to to have sorted out um because and i suppose one of the most key factors in there is your your vesting periods so investors might want to see that you know you basically have a, a vesting schedule for your own shares that's going to last two three four years um which basically um will uh show them that you're not just going to sort of pack up and leave once they put the investment in which is, is, is something that that is obviously incredibly important the same as the same can be said for the ip so your investors need to know that the IP sits with the company and doesn't sit with the founders. Um, 
because again, if they're going to invest, they want shares where the IP sits. Um, so those two things need to be sorted sort of prior to those conversations and are all sort of part of those uh, preparation uh, steps, essentially. So uh, we can handle the background, the cap table stuff, let you know the things that you need to do. Um, the two key points that you will then go ahead and engage with are the SES advanced assurance and, and the term sheet in terms of your preparation. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Pasha for, for these two uh, aspects. Hi everyone, really lovely to see some familiar faces in the crowd. Thanks Max for the handover. Um, so yeah, so what exactly is advanced assurance and why is it important for you guys to receive that before you even start your investor conversations or alongside your investor conversations? So apologies for those experts in the crowd who already know, who already have it, uh, but basically, there are two uh, investment schemes that the government have been rolling out, uh, one being SEIS and the other one being EIS. So the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme and the Enterprise Investment Scheme. Uh, what are these two? So this is these are literally incentives for that the government actually issues out for investors to actually invest in companies. Um, so for the first one, at SEIS, if you're raising up to £150,000, your company might be eligible to allocate 50% tax relief to your to their investors. And if it's more than 150 k that you're raising, it will roll over to the enterprise investment scheme. So they still receive a tax back relief, but it's just reduced a little bit from 50 to 30%. Uh, a common thing you can do, and one thing that people don't realize is you can do both of those things. You can apply for both of those on the same advanced assurance application and your investors on the same round can get both SEIS and EIS tax relief. So how does advanced assurance actually tie in here? So in order for your investors to actually claim back this tax relief, uh, your company needs to be eligible. And for you to actually showcase that you're eligible, you need to file off something called advanced assurance to HMRC, and they can give you that heads up, like, yes, you're eligible, you can get a certificate saying that you are. And I think it's about 60% of all angels in the UK who would only invest in you if you have got that advanced assurance prior to raising funds. So it is quite important that you get that all sent off to HMRC and um, the leeway, I think, uh, they can take up to 30 days to get back to us. I think about three weeks to get back to you once you've sent that advanced assurance application off. But of course, because uh, we have a 98% success rate, we have had people here back within two days. So that's really good. Um, the benefit of, of doing your advanced assurance with our team via Seed Legals as well. Uh, Max, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So why exactly is this? Oh, we've got a question there from Jay. What is the reason for December peak in funding round closing? That's a very good question. We're about to get into that. So uh, when it comes to raising funds, there is seasonalities is quite an aspect. So if you think about it, if you are looking to raise before the end of the tax year. And if you are looking to say um, raise funds for in, in time for Q1 next year, you have to think about the timelines now. So we're coming up to Christmas. Now, naturally, you must all know and are aware that calendars do get blocked out between middle of December to middle of January, where conversations really slow down. So for you to really make benefit and make use of the timelines that you have in mind, and if you want to be ready for Q1, or if you want to even be ready for the end of the taxi next year, really hitting that deadline uh, hard stop deadline for the end of this year uh, by the end of Q4 is really important because you don't want to you kind of want to go in there ahead of the crowd so if you think about it when you can actually claim back tax relief for your your round in one or two scenarios one being the year of the investment and the shares being issued or one year prior to the investment and shares being issued now if you think about it from an investor's point of view April is a massive, it's a massive red flag in their eyes. They want to get things sorted by end of Q1 last year. So not only do they have their own tax returns to do, you might be one of the few companies that they are investing in. So they've got all of this, all of these tax relief um, compliance forms to send out and you want to be at the forefront. You want to be at the, the beginning there, which is why I would say 
take that initiative, show that you're organized, put that good word in with your investor and try and get these things over the line before end of Q4 this year, because it can be a little tricky if you are caught amongst the traffic uh, beginning of next year there as well, um, just because it's kind of, it creates a massive hub it creates a massive hub and uh you know q1 you've got things ready you've got runway um that way for for q1 as well uh, it just it's all about making sure that you've got your investors engaged you're increasing your investor urgency and your investor appetite best way to do that is if you can get that advanced insurance application done over the line as well and the quicker that you get that the quicker that you can actually go ahead and allocate that tax relief to your investors there as well and to reiterate it's the uh two it's the two scenarios. So they can actually claim back that tax relief on the same year of investment after the shares have been allocated at the end of your round or one year prior to the investment being uh, issued there as well. I believe we've got a question in the chat there um, from Aji. So do we need to apply for advanced assurance again through a fresh application if there are some changes to the business model after HMRC has granted advanced assurance? I would say it really does depend. Um, if there are minor tweaks to the business model, I don't think it should be an issue. Now that you've got advanced assurance, I would use that. Um, I would take advantage of that. The best thing to do would be to actually ask that question to our specific SEIS or EIS team. I'm going to put the email here if you would like to know your specific questions or if you've got an account on C Legals, there's a blue chat portal on the bottom right hand side of the screen. And that's a direct line to our SEIS experts there. Um, Max, I think I'm ready for the next slide. Fantastic. OK, so what exactly is a term sheet and why does this play into getting things ready by the end of the tax year or by the end of this year? And also, what are the timelines associated? Do we do this before the advance assurance, do this alongside your advance assurance? So from a timeline perspective, it might feel as though you're being bombarded. There's so much paperwork to get done. There's so much organisational work to get done. Um, but we have kind of nailed down a methodology as to how you can carry this out in the most effective way where it shaves off a few months on the total time in your timeline for your fundraising journey uh, for you to start receiving the funds as soon as possible there as well. So when it comes to actually honing in on an investor's appetite in your company or for raising funds, it's really important to showcase your credibility to them. So you can do this amongst a variety of ways. One being, you know, making sure that you've got your cap table all sorted, got the shares all allocated. When they do their due diligence on you, they can see everything transparently on companies' house. That's quite easy uh, to get done. Uh, and also, I'm here to help you with that as well, if you've got any questions at the end of this. Um, secondly, as well, is what one mistake that a lot of founders do is just go to their first meeting with just their pitch deck. Yes, you can do that. But if you want to stand out amongst the tens of pitches that they see every day, Go there prepared with not just your pitch deck, but also a term sheet alongside this. So what exactly is a term sheet? So a term sheet is a list of conditions on your terms and conditions regarding your round. So equity, drag and tag along rights, um, when or how much you're looking to give away to this particular investor and setting the cornerstone for the rest of the round as well. So this isn't set in stone. So it's kind of starting your negotiations with your investor and you want to go in there with the legal upper hand, right? You wanna go in there with the best foot forward. You don't want them to go ahead and dictate their terms to you because that's when you kind of lose the negotiating power. And of course you must be aware with all negotiations, it's always best to aim high. And with us, what we do is we not only provide you with that framework for the term sheet, we pair you with an investment expert to sit down with you before your very first investor conversations to make sure that your terms and conditions on that term sheet is the most founder friendly ones for you going forward as well. Um, so when does this actually you know, how does this all come in line with your advanced assurance and when do you do this? I think we're ready for the next slide, Max. Yeah, so um, when do we actually do this? So we say, uh, of course, with your advanced assurance, if you're not aware, there's a part of your advanced assurance where you need to state that you've got a letter of intent from your investors that they're willing to, I believe it's about 20%, that they're willing to invest 20% of the funds that you're looking to raise. And the way that you go about doing this is kind of like a chicken and egg situation. So investors 
are not likely to invest in you unless you've got the advance assurance, but on your advance assurance application, you need a letter of intent. So which one comes first? Which is why we say it's important to start your conversations with your investors with your term sheet at hand. Mention that you are looking to apply for advance assurance. Once you've, uh, you know, presented your business case, presented the model, you can then ask alongside your term sheet, or you can even put a little clause in there saying that all of these terms are contingent on you receiving the advance assurance. That way it doesn't stop any negotiations. You then simultaneously get the go ahead from the, your investors to put their name down with the advance assurance, and then you can get that all sent off as well. Um, uh, a good thing to note here as well is even if it isn't that specific investor on the letter of intent that actually goes, that doesn't actually go ahead and investing in your company, that's completely fine. Your advance assurance does still stand through there as well. Uh, I believe, it, is that the end of my slides, Max, or do we have another one there? No, and that, does anyone that, have any, any questions about that at all before we go ahead to the next part of the presentation? That seems fine so yeah over to you max you can you can also save them to the end if uh if they're half half cooked at the moment um thank you uh thank you fascia um so basically we've we've uh now established background checks preparation is, is is very important you've got your ip assignments uh founders agreements cap tables uh and then as uh pasha ran through your advanced assurance application and your term sheet um so once you have all of that done, um, which is what I would advise every single one of you to do basically immediately if you have uh, the desire of, and we'll put our contact details in the next steps at the end, but if you have a desire of, of looking to close sort of before year end, um, essentially once you have that set up uh, and and sort of I felt like doing another description of, of, of what the, the term sheet was, uh, essentially your shareholders agreement is the, is the cornerstone of your rounds um, and the term sheet is the sort of place where you negotiate the, the terms before um, they are legally sort of obliged in your shareholders agreement. So the term sheet is like a non-legally binding version of it. So once you've negotiated that with your investors, everyone's happy. Uh, you have also sent out your advanced assurance uh, application uh, because you've been listening uh, and that has come back approved from HMRC. At that point, you then will basically, it becomes quite, I don't know, <laughs> I say easy, um, easier, uh, then once your terms are agreed, your advance assurance is back, you can basically go through, get your investors to sign the shareholders agreement, uh, which is the legally binding version basically of your term sheet. Uh, at that point, they are able to um, send the money. Uh, your articles of association are updated on company's house. Uh, and then you have your, your board and shareholders resolutions and your SHO1 form, which is sent to company's house to update your, your shareholding. And then your investors get the share certificates and we begin our sort of round closing uh, compliance checks. So this stage is where that investor urgency will really come into its own. I know we had a question previously and I just want to sort of reiterate about you know, why is it that spike at the end of the year? Um, and as I said at the beginning, one really is just seasonality. Uh, the way that we all think is, okay, we want to get this done by the new year. You want to go into that new year with your money, being able to smash it in, in all of your endeavors. Um, but the other thing as well is, is that SEIS component because at the end of the tax year, investors uh, will be basically because you can backdate, as Pasha mentioned, the um, SEIS allowance that investors have, they will lose their allowance from last year come March or April. So from now until basically March, April, they are going to be looking to potentially spend that pool. So end of the year, and a lot of these investors think the same way that you guys do is, okay, I know that allowance is going next March, April, but I want to have it done before I go off on, on, on holiday, et cetera. So that's why there's that spike now as well. Um, sorry, I just thought it was, it was relevant for that point. So anyways, as you go through these, these points, this is where the investor urgency comes in. This is where they're looking to use their SEIS and EIS allowance. This is where they're looking to put in money before uh, at the end of the year. And if you've done everything at the same time, advanced insurance application out, start preparing term sheet, you should be in, in a decent place to do that. Um, and as soon as, as I said, your advanced insurance is back, you can basically crack on with your shareholders agreement and look to start closing the round. Um, so, uh, oops, two, two slides saying that. Oops, I have this animation here, fantastic. Um, okay, so uh, in terms of timelines then, 
So basically everything that we've discussed so far um, can be done through the Seed Legals platform, background checks, advanced assurance, IP, founders agreements, all of that stuff. Um, so essentially this, uh, this little nice uh, image essentially is, is, is a good way of, of mapping out what that looks like. Um, and I will come back to this at the end because I think it's a, it's a really nice visual. Uh, so essentially from day one, so that would be today, you start your, start your round with us essentially. Immediately, you'll have a look through your key deal terms. Uh, this will as well enable you to put in a provision there that says, I'm also applying for advanced assurance right now. So whilst that application's out, you can continue to negotiate with investors so that when it comes back, given that it's improved, they're ready to invest, saving you a few weeks of waiting for it to come back and then approaching investors. You can just put the contingent in that you're applying to it so you can negotiate on the other terms. And if they're happy with those, they'll go great. So as long as your advanced assurance comes back, that's when I'm going to put it in. So day one, you start put your SEIS provisions into your term sheet um, and start planning exactly what terms you want to take your investment on. Uh, as, as Pash mentioned earlier, uh, if you don't know anything about those terms, not a problem at all. Uh, with us, you have a dedicated investment expert who will essentially walk you through those terms uh, and they are there to, to help you sort of basically create the most founder-friendly ones that are gonna give you guys the most autonomy, uh, but ultimately, you know, it's down to negotiation with your investors. So whilst you're working on those terms, uh, as according to the graphic, we'll start on our investment ready checks, cap table, et cetera, all the stuff I talked about earlier, um, and we'll send those over to you in a couple of days. Uh, you can then implement those changes. So maybe you need to do a share split, maybe you incorporate it with one share, uh, maybe you need to issue shares to a co-founder before you start looking to take an investment. Those are the sorts of things that, that we'll come back with as, as part of our investment readyment checks. Um, I don't personally agree with how far along advanced assurance is in this thing. I would have it at day one as well, but I think it makes it a little bit easier to digest if it's the next day. Um, at that point, you get out your, your advanced assurance application so that you can get that SEIS and EIS uh, basically assurance from, from HMRC uh, that you are uh, compliant for SEIS and EIS or your investors will be. Um, so once you've had that term sheet reviewed on our side, you can start negotiating with investors. You're waiting for your advanced assurance to come back. You've negotiated with your investors. And then as soon as those terms are agreed, your advanced assurance comes back, hopefully approved. And then you can create your shareholders agreement, which as I said, is the legally binding document. Um, and at which point, once that is fully signed, uh, your investors can start transferring you those funds and you can look to start closing your round. So um, that's a lot of an incredible amount to do in a, in a short space of time. Uh, we're halfway through November and, you know, uh, and, and as Pasha mentioned, halfway through December is, is when people are starting to pack their bags. So um, I know that's a very short timeline and you guys might be um, in various different stages along that process. What I wanted to say, so I want to reiterate that the first step is always to basically look to, to begin on your term sheet and, and all of those aspects. However, if you do find yourself um, with an investor or two that are ready to go right now, uh, you can't close your round in a month's time. Uh, what are you going to do? Essentially, you know, those investors might be just going on their Christmas holidays, uh, but they've just said to you, you know, here's, here's 10, 20, 30, 50K. Um, you don't want to wait until the new year and, and see, you know, if they've managed to speak to, to someone else in the meantime. So here is where uh, Agile fundraising comes in, essentially. Um, and I'm not sure, I mean, I'm, we've plastered, uh, plastered messaging about agile fundraising. I really think we've pioneered it in the UK. So if any of you have followed Seed Legals, I'm sure you would have um, seen Anthony or, or someone else speak about it. But for those of you that haven't, I'm just going to give you a, a sort of whistle stop tour. Um, essentially, uh, agile fundraising or start from the beginning on the, on the traditional fundraising model. So as you can see here, uh, basically early stage companies will operate on the sort of big, go big or go boss bus model. So funding rounds every 12 to 18 months. Um, and essentially that cycle occurs for a few different reasons. One, because it is, as I'm sure you might have found, quite difficult to, to coral all your investors together, like herding cats or sheep, whichever one's more difficult. Um, <laughs> basically, it's difficult to get all of your investors to come together at the same time. Um, on top of that, which is sort of where we've differentiated ourselves incredibly from, from law firms, um, is that it can take, and it probably does take around three to six months for, for law firms to help you go through the docs and, and close the rounds. And essentially, the other, the other thing as well is negotiations do just take a while. So because of that, 
the previous model was raise for six months in some capacity, close the round, use that for a 12-month runway, and then essentially start raising again a year later. Um, that causes a bunch of problems. Firstly, um, it's incredibly stressful. Uh, secondly, it encourages you to basically take in as much money as you possibly can at one stage because you know you're going to be raising for six months, uh, which basically might result in you giving away more equity than, than you need to. Um, and yeah, I mean, essentially, uh, that's where agile, agile fundraising comes in. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about it. But just to give you some sort of stats around us. So 70% of our users uh, use some form of agile fundraising. This all, all would take place once you'd open the round and Pash and I are basically people that would step you through how to structure this, depending on what investors you have. So don't worry, just taking the, the key points here. 70% of our users use some form of agile fundraising. We've actually seen founders end up giving away uh, about half uh, the amount of equity uh, as, as to previously. So um, in terms of what it is um, or sort of what the difference is here, um, instead of taking in uh, investment over six months, negotiating, closing, spending, basically, and having that little risky dip under the line where you're, you're fundraising again, essentially, and you don't have any money in the bank. Um, with fundraising in and around your, your raise, so in and around what we've been talking about this entire time, there are ways for you to take in capital per investor prior to a raise um, or during a raise, and there are ways of taking it in afterwards as well. And what this causes is you get these little top-ups here. So each one of these bumps would be one, two investors, um, and then you have your big raise uh, spending the money and you continue to top up afterwards. Um, so that agile fundraising divides itself into two sort of big methods. Um, and one is, is, is sort of previous to the raise um, and the other is, is, is post raise. Um, so essentially that is the, the seed fast uh, as, as we've called it, uh, it's the advanced subscription agreement. But, uh, and then you have your instant investment as well uh, or, or deed of adherence. Um, so essentially, uh, seed fast. I'm sure a lot of you know uh, what that is. So I'm sorry if I'm repeating something that you already know. But essentially, they're, they're usually used to raise ahead of a round. All of these have different uses. And again, Pasha and I are the sorts of people to walk you through what they are. But generally, seed fast used ahead of a round. So uh, basically, you don't want to commit to a valuation. Maybe you're going to just launch a new product, or you're working on a deal, or you don't have a, a your your sort of proof of concept just right yet, and you know that your valuation will be much higher in the future. Um, but you need the money right now because you know you're a startup business and, and you hardly have any money. So um, it's a usual sort of bridge between and, and before rounds where you can take in uh, capital per individual investor and then promise them equity later in your raise. Um, so as in the previous graphic, you had taking in capital now, giving them equity. So they give you 50K now, you give them 50K worth of equity when you close your rounds two months later. To put this into the Christmas scenario, that would be great. I've started my round, going with my term sheets, done my background checks, getting a lot of investor interest. Great, I've got two people here ready to go. They've got you know however much money each. Um, don't want to lose the momentum here. Don't have enough really to close the round right now. Seed fast, great. Taking that 25K, taking that 25K, close my rounds. In accordance with the tax year still, you know, January, February buys you a month or so, but you've managed to secure that investment now. And then when you close your rounds, you will give them their investments worth of equity. So that's the seed fast. Um, the instant investment is essentially on the other side of a raise usually. And that is if you've closed your rounds and you've put provisions in the term sheet and your investment expert will help walk you through this, but you'll put provisions in your term sheet that says, uh, my investors allow me to top up my round with another, you know, 200, whatever K over the course of the next year. What this means is you're not closing the rounds, doing a 12 month runway and then raising again. Actually, you've closed the rounds. And if three months later you bump, you bump into an investor that says, oh my God, that, that, that idea is fantastic. You know, when, when's your next raise? Essentially you go, well, as long as you agree with the terms that, that I set my last raise, I'm going to give you this instant investment and it is just straight cash for equity. And the best thing is you can do it at a higher valuation than what you raised at. So it enables you to top up without having to coral again, all those investors together. So these are the agile ways of raising, um, which have A, reduce the amount of equity that people give away um, and B, give founders more flexible uh, raises, which ultimately uh, puts you in the position to um, focus more on your business, which is the most important thing, and use that money. So to basically wrap it up slightly, um, 
the sort of key points that we covered before we go into uh into question time is uh it's uh incredibly busy time of the year um we've delved into a little bit why you've got the uh, seis and eis factors and you've just got the good old uh it is 2022 next year let's get this stuff done and probably some uh, combination of both you want to leverage that investor appetite and urgency and you want to beat the curve and you want to especially beat the curve of other uh, founders who who might be going you know hell for leather in, in in the new year and ultimately these rounds can take anywhere between two and six months so you don't want to start in the new year and find yourself falling outside the tax year and that investment has gone somewhere else so leverage the urgency beat the curve um, so essentially, you can take advantage of that by getting started, getting prepared today. As we covered previously, that's your advance assurance, your term sheet, your compliance, your background checks, your founders agreements, your IP assignments, and, and all of that lovely stuff. Um, and essentially, uh, Pasha then went on to explain what, why uh, advance assurance and term sheets are important. Um, and it is really just to get those conversations going, impress your investors, start negotiating early and do that together because they are the two most time consuming parts of the process. So doing them together saves you about a month or two waiting for one to come back. So final thing was, if you can't close by the end of the year, it's not the end of the world. As long as you get started now, if you've got those investors ready to go and they're happy to use agile ways of fundraising, then you have those methods there. And someone like Pasha and myself would make sure that uh, you went, okay, great. I've got this investor, Max. What do I do? Here's the seed fast. You remember what I told you in your webinar. Um, no, Max, can you explain it again? Okay, fine. Um, so essentially just to, to, to sort of um, come back to this, because to be honest, I just think this is, is really important. You have go, term sheet, investment checks, advanced assurance, and then you've got this uh, cap relaxing with your money, although you're not going to be relaxing because you'll be spending it and focusing on your ventures. So uh, that sort of brings this to uh, a close. Um, if Thank you, obviously, all for, for listening and, and being patient uh, and uh, not heckling me from all of my bad jokes. Uh, so essentially, I'm going to go on mute now. And uh, if any of you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask slash I think there are probably quite a few in the chat box. So if Pasha, you want to just have a look through those because I can't get that up. Yes, so got quite a few there. Um... It's a really good question here. So if I have an investor ready and they have made commitments and we need support with the documents to close the deal, how much do seed legals charge and what's the level of support from the term sheet onwards? Max, do you want to put in uh, some answers about the pricing? You're on mute, I think. Yeah, I know. I was just trying, trying to find the question. I managed to um, manage to get About it up. 12.30, yeah, it came through on 12.30 after I sent in the email. Okay. Um, uh, oh, and it should be one eye with SEIS at cvegals.com, not two eyes there for everyone if you want to send over your questions to that team. But yeah, so can you see it's about how, if you walk us through the pricing. Do, do, you, wanna, the do you wanna just take, do you wanna take this one? I'll take another yeah, one so I can it find it. <laughs> Well, yeah. So the way that we work as a business is we would charge you a percentage fee based on your round. What that means is you will get unlimited support from the very beginning to the end alongside all of the framework that you need for a successful round and making sure everything is legally binding and everything is updated on company's house properly. So we don't charge you billable hours, which is why the percentage fee comes in, because of course, the level of support need needed will be increased with the higher raise amount. So uh, to begin with, we would charge you an engagement fee of 600 pounds plus VAT. This gives you access to your investment expert for an unlimited amount of time. And also the full funding round document. So your term sheet, your shareholders agreement, your board and shareholders resolution, all the way down to the SHO1 form, which needs to be filed to make your shareholders, investor shareholders in the company. And in terms of the percentage fee in total, we charge you, say, if you're raising up to 300K, we charge you a 1% fee. So anything above 300K to 1 million, that gets reduced down to 0.5%. So say for a £500,000 raise, we would charge you £4,000 plus VAT from end to finish there. But of course, the only thing you'd be paying up front will be £600. And then the remainder of the fee, so the remaining 3400 will only be billed when you've successfully raised and that money is in your account. I hope that answers your questions, Stuart. 
yeah, I found found the next one. So I'll hop in here. Also, just for um, because I didn't say earlier, for um anyone basically looking to to get this uh, process started, um, either email um Pasha or myself, even if you just want to to rehash uh, any of this stuff, both of our emails are there, um, and we can walk you through uh, next steps and help sort of strategize uh, what your timelines look like. So um, yes, I think there'll be a recorded. Yeah, this is recorded. That was the next question. Uh, will the lead investor not put forward their own term sheet rather than us supply? Very, uh, very good question, actually. So um, traditionally, that is how I think it used to happen. Uh, and because we've now got market share of these rounds, I think we've really sort of flipped the script here as, as well with, with agile fundraising. You will see maybe with VCs more often that they would put, put a term sheet uh, forward first. However, putting your own term sheet forward first does does a number of things. Um, firstly, I'd like to start by saying this is your business. Um, so essentially, you should at least put your front foot forward with the terms that are going to be founder friendly. Investors are not going to pull out or not want to invest because you've put a term sheet that has founder friendly terms on it. If anything, it's going to be okay. Well, these people obviously know what they're doing. Uh, it is the art of negotiation and you lose the art of negotiation when you just are negotiating on, on the back foot already. However, what we will see sometimes is uh, an investor will go, uh, or a founders, sorry, will go forward with their term sheet. There will be investor pushback. They'll come back to us. What does this pushback look like? We will essentially help walk you through it. What does that actually mean? How founder friendly is it? Uh, what would you advise? And then you would basically go uh, back to the founder uh, until you've agreed your shareholders agreement. Um, and on top of that as well, uh, you know, having the term sheet there, as we said earlier, it is uh, impressive to the founders and it instigates that conversation earlier, it makes it look like you're investment ready. And finally, uh, founders are, are have an incredible amount of, of, of FOMO. Um, and I'm sure, I don't know if any of you are in, in a fundraise right now, but if you've got a certain percentage of that raise done, you will find the investor that wasn't there for you two months ago is suddenly willing to put money in once they've seen that other people are committed. Um, you need to try and get those signatures on the term sheet as quickly as possible. Um, and faffing about waiting for a term sheet to come to you um, is, is not sort of advisable. Even if you do end up agreeing with every single thing on their term sheet, great. But as I said, investors aren't going to pull out because you've started with a term sheet. Um, the next one, I don't know if you've read it. It's, uh, so yeah, if you're raising part of the round via both angels and crowdfunding campaign, would Seedfast be most advisable an option to secure ahead of the campaign? And to do Seedfast, you need to have all these documents in place, or can you close quickly um, this quickly and then set all the documentation via the crowdfunding platform? Interesting question again. So essentially, um, what I would advise for numerous different reasons, it might take too long to go into them, is even if you are doing uh, a crowdfund crowdfunding raise, I would do them via our docs. Uh, we have provisions for both Cedars and Crowdcube, and most founders that would use uh, Cedars or Crowdcube, both great platforms, would basically do their raise via our docs. The reason being is you can do that agile fundraising for the angels that you've brought to the table, so you can take your capital in early because Cedars and Crowdcube take sort of three to six months to close, and you can't spend the money until after you've closed the round. So basically using our docs means you can be a bit more agile. You can take those seed files in uh, and then basically wait for Cedars and, and, and Crowdcube to finish that round. The other thing which I've seen recently as well is if you have any angels or VCs that come in and have incredibly complex requirements or terms, uh, they can't facilitate that. So I had a founder in, in a case where they spoke to me and they've had to now pull the entire thing off um, and, and are now using our documents uh, because they wanted to go with this this angel and BC because, you know, it's good terms or et cetera. So um, using us will, will protect you against both of those things. But yes, you can use those seed files and they are advisable. Um, and essentially, you don't need to have those, those documents in place, the, the shareholders, et cetera, to use a seed fast. However, they will be converting within the round. So it is advisable just to get those background checks and stuff started in the first place. So I hope that answered it. Um, great. So uh, if you could send them a deck plus a term sheet, would investors like that? Um, I would say uh, that you would probably start with, uh, with a deck and an intro. And if you had that interest because it's cold, then you would probably send them the term sheet. Sending a term sheet just on a cold call email might be a little bit presumptuous. Um, that is just my opinion, but essentially having your term sheet there for uh, 
warmer conversations is, uh, is, is, is probably when you're going to capitalize once you've got them on the phone or, or, or something like that. I would always advise if you're meeting these people to have a term sheet in, your, in, in the back pocket. I don't think you could fit one in there, but you know what I mean? Um, but for a cold call email, it might be a, might be a, a little bit much. Um, okay, German startup, how, how many of these? I've got so many of these. I'm going to try and really rapidly fire through them. Can a German startup apply for the advanced assurance when it's about to get in touch with investors from the UK? So yes, foreign companies can apply to SEIS and we actually do that quite a lot. Um, there are some criteria that you have to fill. Um, please email me if um, for further clarification because I have a good template email I can send you. Uh, but essentially, um, you have to satisfy having a uh, business in the UK, which is actually quite easy to do. You just register for UTR and you have to have an agent uh, who can act on behalf of the company. So that's where it gets a little bit ambiguous, but basically you need to have someone that has the power to act on behalf of the company based on the UK um, who can sign documents for you, et cetera. And then you can use us for your advanced assurance application and still benefit from that SEIS scheme, which is a, a nice little loophole hole for, uh, for foreign companies. Okay, next. Um, do you have a? I'm not sure, Pasha. Do you have a, Do you have a large network of partners that know how to use and leverage seed legals? Um, yeah. So with this question, we don't make any third party introductions to uh, to any uh, investors or any solicitors there. But when it comes to these kind of things, what we have seen do uh, what we have seen is a lot of founders will will actually set up another user on their account. So for example, if you've got an accountant or if you've got a lawyer yourself and they are the ones who want to use seed legals rather than you having to deal with it, of course, it's very easy for everybody to use, but you can set up multiple users in the account for other team members to go ahead and do that all on your behalf. But when it comes to um, actually finding those solicitors yourself, we, we, we don't recommend that you do that because we are here to kind of eradicate the need for any solicitors as well. Um, so for that reason, that's why we don't necessarily partner with any law firms because we are a legal tech company and our main aim is to streamline that as much as possible. So you don't need, you can avoid uh, billable hours using any solicitors or lawyers there. I hope that makes sense, Albert. Thank you, Pasha. Um, so how old should business be not to qualify? Be not to qualify for it. So basically, Two years trading for SEIS, anything older than that, um, you're not eligible for 50% um, tax relief. That moves you into EIS, which is then for seven years. So I hope that answers that question. What happens if you only need to raise a one-off fund? Uh, speak to Pasha I, I about it. Essentially, what you will do is either, if you need your articles updated, I would suggest a bootstrap round, which is a lighter, cheaper version of the, the full seed round, um, but we'll update your articles um, if... Uh, if it's just if it's just straight cash for equity and you don't care about any sort of terms or, or updating your articles, then uh, you would use probably some form of agile fundraising. But we would discuss it on a, on a case by case basis. Um, are you able to assist in finding investors? Fantastic question. I hear it every day. Um, we don't offer it as a service. Um, however, if you were uh, using us for your raise, um, I would intro you to um, uh, our, our head of partnerships who, who might be able to help with circulating pitch tech business plans, but by no means is it a service. We don't charge for it. It's just trying to help our founders. We are a legal tech platform. We help you with the legals and the support. Um, so it's a yes and no. It's a no with a hint of we'll try and see what we can do to help. Does the seed fast grant discounts earlier investors? If not, how they're awarded? Great question. Yes, it does. You can grant discount for early investors. Um, there are two ways you could reward them. One, you could give them some of your SEIS allowance. Two, you could give them uh, a discount. Or three, you could give them a fixed valuation that you know is going to be lower than the one in your round. Those are the key ways of rewarding those early investors. But great, great question. What is the best strategy for deciding the long stop valuation? <laughs> Again, it's, it's how long it's a bit of a how long's a piece of string question we have a bunch of really good articles on um so just look up seed legal's valuation uh at looking at how to value your company um pash has come off mute here so i feel like she's got something killer yeah well i was going to say one thing that we do also advise is look at TechCrunch or other articles which actually advertise other fundraisers look at um companies similar to you or in a similar industry have a look at what they raised and if it's similar to you what they valued their company at but of course 
this factors in say how much you're looking to raise how much equity you're looking to give away and the most important one is how much traction you've already gotten in your company that really does boost your company valuation if you've got your mvp so on and so forth and again like max mentioned we do have an article on our platform to help with that too perfect um and yeah monthly fee so it it it, it depends um essentially it, we're running an, an offer right now where if you get started with your advanced assurance and your um funding round with us um we will put you on a subscription worth uh, 49 pounds a month for uh, free for the duration of your round so you know if you guys are uh, are gunning it and manage to close by the end of next month you've got a, a month and a half there um, but if you do trickle over to the six months mark you know you're saving yourself that subscription fee however if you just wanted to opt for for one of the products and um, we do have a basic subscription that'll give you access to the platform uh, which is 29 pounds a month um, however uh, we don't we don't hold you ra ransom to your to your information or anything like that if you want to jump off not use us for a month come back on uh, that's completely up to you you can download the documents um basically you can uh that information will be there so you can pay for a month do your rounds come back whatever you'd like to do but yes there is a, a monthly fee in unless you do both um two-year-old startup eligible for the advanced SEIS application so as I said SEIS the 50% tax relief is two years of trading so you might fall under the definition of what is trading um, and someone has used this analogy on me once and I haven't been able to use another one since essentially trading is basically if you were a physical shop and you had your, your doors open uh, for, for sale that day and someone could come in and buy something that would be trading even if they didn't even if you didn't sell something that day so if you were able to sell your product at that point that is when you'd be trading uh, is a bit of a gray area with hmrc and doing your advanced students application with us if you're on the precipice is the best chance you have of, of getting accepted we've got a 98 percent success rate which i'm sure um uh Pasha said uh but essentially um after you do the two years, though, you would move into EIS for up to seven years, which is 30%, so it's still 100% worth, worth doing it. Yeah, and Patrick Pitt and Valuation article, fantastic. Um, okay, can early investors agree to term a future funding round if they convert at long stop day? Do you understand that, Pasha? Okay, very welcome, Olivia. Um, um, um... Oh, oh, if you invest via seed fast, could you agree to the terms of the future? So I wouldn't negotiate terms with seed fast people because essentially you can't guarantee that those are going to be the terms that you close on. So you could take an investor and buy a seed fast. The seed fast is just a straight cash for equity, uh, not a straight sort of taking the money now, I'll give you shares later, Doc. Um, it essentially converts within the rounds and all the terms that you've agreed within the rounds apply to the seed fast. Um, but essentially investors are waiving their right i suppose to negotiate for the terms in that round so if you do have investors that will only invest given that they want certain terms then i would say to them okay great i'm looking to close my round in you know two months time uh basically can you invest then or um if, if they don't mind then you could take it in then essentially um could you take early stage vc angel for side and then look at crowdfunding campaign or just taking vc funding um so traditionally, the steps kind of go angel crowdfunding VCs, but there is no set order. Um, and essentially, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry if you've got people that are interested and you've spoken to us and you've got founder friendly terms, um, then I wouldn't be worried about what who specifically you're taking funding in from. Um, although I would make sure you do your your um, checks obviously on on your investors. Um, how do HMRC calculate the trading period for SEIS? Again, so I, I mentioned that it's a grey area, um, and I would definitely speak to our SEIS team uh, that Pasha sort of put, put the email in for. Um, however, it, it is essentially from that date that you could potentially sell something, even if you don't actually make a, a sale on that day. So those are all the questions. Wow, that was rattled through them. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for, for joining. Again, as I said, please reach out to a uh, Pasha uh, or, or or myself, um, I'm looking forward to speaking to hopefully a lot of you individually, um, and we will yeah basically rehash what we've said and help you uh, begin your 
agile fundraising, funding rounds, advanced assurance, and hopefully close by year end or very soon after. Um, and have have a lovely day, everyone, as well. And I'm going to make sure that this uh, meeting, Zoom meeting, is is, is present somewhere. Um, so I will, uh, yeah, we will put it up on the on the Seed Eagles page or on Patch on my own LinkedIn as well. Perfect. All right. How do I end this? Ah, here we go. Bye, everyone. Thank you.